Okay, thank you. Um, there's a lot happening, a great deal happening on landscape scale conservation in the UK at the moment. Uh, and I want to just explore some of the ramifications of that. Now, quite a lot of what I'm going to say, which is mo much more general than some of the wonderful specific examples we've heard, uh, have been touched on already, and I'll try as I go through to back, back refer back to some of the splendid contributions that we've had. Uh, but I'm, first of all, I'm going to present a simple theoretical framework for what we're actually doing when we think about various kinds of nature conservation through to uh, extreme rewilding. Uh, I'm going to give a summary of some of the examples of this really huge amount of activity that's now going on. Um, I want to touch briefly on the, on the discussion between land sharing and complete rewilding. Uh, and then I want to uh, um, look at natural flood management as an example of win, 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 win. Uh, where we, a lot of what's being done has actually nothing to do with nature conservation, but delivers huge amounts of interesting nature conservation. And I want to finish off by thinking about some of the headwinds, because I want you all to leave thinking, wow, yeah, this is great, but I want you not to leave in a naive kind of way thinking this is going to be dead simple, because it isn't, and it's complicated, and there will be and are headwinds. So this, some of you have seen this before. I make no apology for that. Uh, but some of you may not have done. This is a, an attempt to describe what we do in tropical nature conservation. This, is the, uh, this little blob in here is a, is, is a nature reserve, a, a national park or what have you. And this is the size along here on a log scale from tiny pocket handkerchief reserves of one hectare down to things the size of uh, 10 to the 5 kilometres squares. So this is, a, this is area along here. And this is a, a, a qualitative scale about the management intensity of those sites. There's enough evidence now to show, I think Bill referred to it, when you've got a small nature reserve at this end, and, Hans, uh, and Franz has also referred to it, little sites need a lot of very intense management per unit area. And we know that because the cost of managing small reserves per unit area is much bigger than the cost of managing big reserves per unit area. So the relationship's got to be something like that. It's sort of sausage shaped. Um, and at this end, we've the, the top end here, uh, we've got traditional uh, nature reserves, uh, UK reserves, sites of special scientific interest, wildlife trust reserves, RHPB and so on, some of which are tiny, some of which get bigger. And then as you get towards the middle, you've got things like the Nepa State and Wild Ennerdale, which has barely been mentioned uh, during the course, but the rewilding that's going on in Ennerdale. And then down at this bottom end, we've got a set of miscellaneous, really big sites that I happen to be personally uh, familiar with, but you can fill in your own. But this is the Palesi Reserve in the area in, in, around the Chernobyl reactor in Belarus. Uh, when the Chernobyl reactor went bang, there's now a massive, the biggest rewilding project in Europe, it just happens to be accidental. And when I went to talk to uh, the, the Wild Ennerdale people a couple of years ago with George Mumbio and, and, and one or two other people, I suggested the best thing that could happen for the Lake District would, would be for Sellafield to go bang. Um, because actually, Pelesi turns out to be exactly the same size as the Lake District. My comments did not go down well. And then at this end, you've got things like Yellowstone, Okavango, and Anus Fandas Personal, which has been mentioned several times. Now, that's a sort of hold that in your head, because what we're doing, and what we're trying to do in nature conservation, is move nature conservation in this direction. We've been talking about the processes of moving conservation from the top left in this diagram towards the bottom right. That's all we've been talking about. It's as simple as that. Now, and we tend to use rewilding in two really rather different ways. You've, let's call it George Monby or rewilding, because George is a real visionary. And you know, you, you, you can take an area the size of Wales, you get rid of all the people, you put bears and wolves back in, and you let it rip. That scares the hell out of politicians. It really, really bothers. But, but it's for all kinds of perfectly reasonable reasons. Nothing wrong with that vision, and we may be able to do it, not necessarily at the scale of Wales, but certainly on big scales in, in, in this country. I prefer to think of rewilding as a process. Rewilding is a process in which we move as far as possible from here down to here um, in, uh, in, in, in the direction of magnitude as far as we can, given the circumstances. 
As we do that, we should reduce the amount of management we need to do per unit area as we restore more and more natural processes so we don't need to cut the grass with, a, with, 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 with nail scissors and so on, grazing animals take over, etc., etc. So, pure rewilding sits down somewhere uh, down in the bottom right-hand part of, of this diagram. That, that's what we've been talking about, uh, and that's what I, wanted, you know, I want you to ha have in your heads. Now... What's actually happening in the UK and in Europe right now is actually very exciting. Going roughly from small initiatives to really big initiatives, the things in pink on here, by the way, are things I'm actually going to talk about. The things in green are so familiar to you all, I don't really need to touch on them. I want to just briefly touch on the Game and Wild Wildlife and Conservation, Conservation Trust Natural England Farmer Cluster Initiative. I want to talk about nature improvement areas briefly because I would, wouldn't I? Um, I want to talk about, I won't talk about wildlife trust living landscapes or RSPB futurescapes. I want to talk about the National Trust Priority Habitats Initiative, uh, the Energy Lottery Funds Landscape Partnerships, uh, Rewilding Britain, uh, we, you know, we, we, we've touched on. And then I want to talk about the new uh, Cambridge Conservation Institute's Endangered Landscapes Programme that they're administering. Uh, Bill mentioned a new, very new, big, exciting programme. So that's a lot of activity, and it isn't the only thing that's going on by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, the, you've got uh, things like the Great Fen Project, the Nepa Estate, Wild Ennerdale, etc., etc., etc. There's an awful lot of habitat restoration and recreation, moving nature conservation from the top left of my diagram towards the bottom right as much as possible wherever we can do it. The really interesting question, and I was going to try and do it for this talk and then I gave up because I realised it was a much bigger issue, is given all that activity, have we reached a tipping point at which as a nation, either in England or in Scotland or in the UK or wherever, as, as, a, as a nation, have we reached a point when the rate at which we're restoring nature is bigger than the rate at which we're destroying it? Because, oh, that's a lot of activity, but if we're still losing the war, it isn't going to be enough. I'd love somebody to do that calculation. You're probably going to have to do it uh, by, by random, you know, random 10 kilometer squares or what have you. Look at what's happening at that kind of scale. But it ought also to be possible to assemble sufficient evidence about the scale and size of some of these things to see whether... Actually, we've, we're getting to the point, we're getting to a tipping point. We're beginning to win the war in terms of the balance of habitat destruction versus habitat recreation. But I don't know the answer to that. Anyway, let's start with nature improvement areas just very quickly because there are there's some valuable things to learn. Uh, for those of you who don't know, in 2010, um, I, cha I chaired a working group that produced a report called Making Space for Nature um, and uh, a view of England's wildlife sites. And... Um, the really, out of that came the nature improvement areas as one of the recommendations in making space for nature. There's an awful lot of recommendations incidentally about things like tax incentives, about uh, offsetting and so on and so forth. It isn't just about nature improvement areas. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the, really, the, the, the really important thing about the recommendation for a competition to create 12 nature improvement areas was that it was based on the vision of consortia of the willing. Nobody was going to impose a nature improvement area on anybody, anywhere. Communities, industry, local ateliers, local authorities, county councils, the usual suspects in the nature conservation organisations had to come together in consortia of the willing because they wanted to create Make, the, 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 make their local environment more interesting and richer in wildlife. And when we're thinking about rewilding and all these other, you know, and anything in between, it, they will have to be consortia of the willing. It's the only way. Nobody's going to impose them. If we try and impose them on people, we will not succeed. You would be amazed by how many people were excited by nature improvement areas. We had 76 bids from all over the country including the leader of one of the UK's major northwestern cities, uh, where he said that you know, where they wanted to get a nature improvement area, they didn't actually quite get it. But the leader of one of the great northwestern cities in, in, in England is on the record as saying uh, that, that access to high-quality green space and interesting nature 
is not an impediment to economic process, pro progress. It is fundamental to it. The, the, one of the places that did get a nature improvement area was, was, the, was the, 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 the Outer Thames marshes, and there's a place called Thurrock uh, in Essex, which you've ever been to Thur There's nobody from Thurrock here, is there? <laughs> it's not got a lot going for it anyway. Uh, and the, the, but it was in part of the nature improvement area, and we went to do a workshop with the Thurrock Council, the leader, of the, the leader of the council, the chief executive were there all day. Uh, and uh, I said, boy, you know, it's a real investment. It's great to see you here. Uh, you know, how, uh, why are you so interested? He said, well, Thurrock's got bugger all else going for it. <laughs> that's, that, that's probably going to go viral now. <laughs> anyway, so, so the point is, the consortia of the willing uh, are, are what it's about, and we need to remember that. Uh, the going mantra was this more, bigger, better, and joined. I, I would love to say that, that was, uh, I, made the, I, I invented that. It was in the report I wrote, but I didn't invent it. That's Tom Chu, who came up with them, that, marvelous catch, that, that marvelous set of words that encapsulates what we're trying to do in nature conservation. Uh, and Tom said it was about as much as the average cabinet minister could cope with. More sites, bigger sites, better managed sites, joined up sites, and so on. And those are the 12 winners. Uh, they're, they're scattered all over. The, it was just England, by the way, and it was just terrestrial habitats. The modal size is, is 500 square kilometres, uh, but of course there's a, there's a range there, but only part of each nature improvement area was set aside for either habitat restoration, recreation, or, or conservation. Um, and uh, so it's classical land sharing. And I want to continue to remind you that a lot of what we're going to be doing, uh, as we heard. Uh, for, uh, in some of the talks this morning and yesterday, what we do in nature conservation now in northwest Europe is enmeshed in a landscape that is, is a working landscape, an urban landscape, an infrastructure landscape, and so on. So, it, it, in a lot of what we do is going to be land sharing, sharing nature with a working landscape for people. This is the, uh, the, 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 the next initiative, which is relatively new, the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust Natural England Farmers Cluster Initiative, <coughs> which uh, it, it helps, groups of farm, helps groups of farmers to work together collectively to deliver nature conservation uh, for the benefits of, of soil and wildlife and the landscape and, and, and so on. Um, it starts at the farmer level from the bottom up, and it's based on the, the, the way that the nature improvement areas were developed as consortia of the willing. Um, and uh, it's based on the, particularly this one, the uh, Marlborough Downs nature improvement area, which was entirely farmer led. So this was an intensely arable area uh, on the Marlborough Downs. Everything in blue and green on there is, is, is natural infrastructure put back in or protected by the farmers because the farmers wanted to do it. Um, and uh, the, the, this, is, this is not the nature, this is not the, uh, uh, the, the Marlborough Downs. Uh, the, uh, you might recognise this gentleman. Uh, that's actually the South Downs, which was another nature improvement area, but it's the only picture I had of downland with a naturalist on it. So the, 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 this new initiative, it's, uh, it's now grown. Uh, to, to there are about 23 farm clusters going in. Um, it's relatively modest land sharing, but again, it's putting space back for nature in the landscape. The National Trust's Priority Habitats Initiative is a much, much bigger operation. Um, the aim of the National Trust is over the next, uh, by 2025, uh, to create and restore 25,000 hectares of trust land uh, in, it back, they put it back into good heart for nature. That's, about only, that's only about 10% of the National Trust land holdings, by the way. Um, they want to have 50% of the farmland uh, it, it, nature friendly by then. Uh, the target habitats uh, in need of, uh, of, of support and recreation include things like hedge planting, new woodlands, lowland meadows, restoring chalk grassland, creating wetlands, etc. etc. And the, the really important thing again is its partnerships with the tenant farmers on National Trust land. So it's classical land sharing again, um, and uh, it's very mild rewilding. Uh, but it's setting, it's setting quite an a, a ambitious target for the amount of land put back into uh, nature conservation. And then you've got the Heritage Lottery Fund's Landscape Partnership Scheme. Um, the Heritage Lottery Fund uh, is, 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 is definition of heritage 
um, is widely drawn, and quite rightly so. There was a very interesting debate in the Heritage Lottery Fund about whether wildlife was heritage. And I gave a, had to go and give a talk about why, life, why, why wildlife is heritage and pointed out that uh, things like cuckoos, you know, cuckoos and daffodils are deeply ingrained in the in British psyche. Um, I wondered lonely as a cloud and all that stuff. You know, <laughs> wildlife is part of our heritage very much and Heritage Lottery Fund accept that. Uh, and they're now interested in doing a lot of work, again, on a big scale, in putting back land for, for nature conservation. Um, quite a lot of the grants, it looks like they're spending enormous amounts of money, are not actually going to be spent on wildlife conservation as such, but they're spending significant amounts of money on restoring landscapes. Um, and in October 2000, well, the, 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 in October 2016, it, the Heritage Lottery Fund had put £36 million into this project in 13 areas, all the way from Orkney to Cornwall, uh, with covering a total of 3,000 square kilometres. That's big landscape recreation and restoration. And the Heritage Fund website, now if you go on the website, but there's a next round in, uh, now, uh, they're looking to, for grants ranging from 100k to 3 million to continue that work. Now that again is big scale habitat restoration and recreation and very much to be welcomed. And then the final initiative, which Bill mentioned, is this new exciting one, the Cambridge Conservation Initiative uh, on, en on Endangered Landscapes Programme. It's money that the Cambridge Conservation Initiative are administering. It's a major new initiative. It's European-wide, and it, it aims to support restored and uh, landscapes for biodiversity conservation on a large scale. Um, and um, actually, that's the wrong that's the wrong slide. Ah, that's the one. They should, that one shouldn't have been in. <laughs> So anyway, the beginning was the same, but the end is the end. I got the answers to some of the questions by the time we'd done it. It's based on a marvellous philanthropic gesture uh, from the Arcadia Charitable Trust, which is from Peter Baldwin and, and Lisbeth Rousing, who've given three thirty million dollars to Cambridge Conservation, the Cambridge Conservation Initiative, to. Uh, to, 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 to use at a European scale to manage for habitat restoration and recreation. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the demonstrations show that you can indeed restore these endangered landscapes. Quite a lot of it uh, will be, again, land sharing, but some of it will be moving towards really the more, uh, the, the more extreme end of, of, of rewilding. Um, and uh, the, the, the aim is to provide long-term sustainable restoration of habitats throughout Europe. Now, $30 million is a hell of a lot of money, but actually distributed across the whole of Europe, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's not a very huge amount of money, generous as that philanthropic gesture is. The hope will be that we will continue to, uh, uh, to re rece receive support after the initial five-year programme. And I'm... Absolutely I'm absolutely delighted to have been asked that I'm going to chair the board that will give out the money, judge the competition and give out the money. Be nice to me. Um, so that's just some of the things going on. And, you know, you can't help but when you look at that scale of activity, you look at the, some of the private initiatives, you can't help but think, yes, we really are going on a journey. The train is already leaving. The, there can be an artificial tension between land sharing and most of what we do in Europe because of the nature of the landscapes that are already densely occupied by people is land sharing versus the desire for pure rewilding. I think to say there's a, a problem there is, 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 is pointless and divisive. Uh, I don't think there's any point in worrying about it uh, because there are, as several people have alluded to in this conference, you know, there are no surviving natural that is unaffected by human activities, habitats in the UK and over large parts of Europe, certainly not in the UK. Virtually all our habitats have been impacted by human beings for millennia and only exist because of human impacts for millennia. Uh, and a lot of our most precious wildlife habitats are, are only there as a result of human impacts. So, um, the, the, you know, and they're meshed in, a, in working landscapes. So if we want to restore nature and improve nature conservation, it's going to have to be land sharing on habitats that are already heavily humanly modified. But where we can, if we do have opportunities to really, really rewild on a big scale, let's go for it. But that's the bottom right-hand corner of, that, of my initial diagram. 
Um, and uh, they, they, uh, and we, so we need more uh, Us van der Plassens, Neps and Ennerdales. Um, and uh, the more of those we can get, the better. And if we can do sort of really quite impressive middling, mid, middle rank rewilding, because there's still quite a lot of management, it's somewhere as close to Gatwick Airport as this. We can do it anywhere. You know, this is the southeast of England, for crying out loud. If you can do it here, we can do it anywhere. And if you can do as van der Platten in the Netherlands, which is the most densely populated country in, in Europe, you can do it anywhere. So let's not pretend that we can't make space for nature, because we can, and we must. But some of the most exciting things that are happening, actually, have, do not have their roots in nature conservation. Bill alluded to uh, water, water boards and water authorities being interested uh, in producing clean water. That's true in, south, in, 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 the, in, in the Coombe grasslands in, in Devon in, in the southwest of England and up on the, on, the, on the Pennines in the Dark Peak. Water companies are actually paying nature conservation organisations to restore habitats. Why? Because it turns out to be about 60 times cheaper to produce clean water if you restore the source of that water, which is the Coombe grassland and the moorland, than it is to build a water treatment works. It's a no-brainer. On the northern Pennines, um, some of the uh, things that are going on there is a partnership between landowners, uh, 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 we, we invested about £12 million pounds to date, uh, which is called the York Peak, the Yorkshire Peat Partnership. Um, uh, about £12 million today, where we're, where we're through the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust in partnership with Yorkshire Water, the Environment Agency, Natural England and the Rural Development Fund, restoring upland peat bogs and, uh, and byres um, throughout a vast areas of the northern Pennines um, that, uh, to, to, to produce better quality water uh, to, for downstream flood control, because you, the, the, once you restore the sponge back on the moorland, the water doesn't run off straight away. Uh, it's a massive star, carbon store, uh, and it's great for wildlife and people. The motivation for this has nothing to do with conservation. It has to do with flood control, landscape, etc., etc. But in, in addition to that, it's also delivering fantastic nature conservation. So it's a terrific opportunity if we, are, if we work in, uh, think about these kind of things and work in these kinds of ways. I'm now, I'm now on the project board for Leeds City Council. Bill mentioned York flooding uh, recently. Well, York floods were minor compared with Leeds and Tadcaster and other, other major cities in, the, in, in, in Yorkshire the, the, the Christmas, the last Christmas um, when the, the, the massive flood, flooding, devastating damage, billions of pounds of damage. I'm now we're on the project board with Leeds City Council, where we're taking the river air, flows through the middle of the reason, it's the river air that did the damage. And we've persuaded, the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust have persuaded Leeds City Council to go for natural flood management big time. As well as traditional engineering flood management in the city. But the idea of the natural flood management is you take the air catchment upstream from the Leeds right the way to Malham Tarn and the moor above, uh, and then you put in, you restore the peat bogs, you put in meanders, you plant trees, uh, you, you create new washlands, etc., 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 all the way down the whole of the air catchment. And if you do that, that's a huge habitat restoration recreation project. What you're doing that is to take the peak out of the flood water as it rushes through Leeds in the middle of the winter. Um, and uh, in, it, what, so you, what you get for the Leeds city is a much more co a very cost-effective flood control scheme, we hope, and you get fantastic wildlife streams, wildlife habitats upstream of Leeds. If we can do that in Leeds, we can do that for all kinds of places around the UK. It becomes a sort of demonstration project for how you can work with people and wildlife for the benefit of people, for the benefit of wildlife, for the benefit of landscapes. Again, it's win, win, win. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the most exciting things I've been involved with is a huge, millions and millions of pounds involved um, and uh, whether in, in, it's in the pipeline and the leader of the city council said they're going to do it, uh, I'll believe it in five years' time. But it's exciting. This is what, this, all this, as, as I say, is exciting and I, I, it really does fire me up. Uh, but, you know, we will hit... Headwinds. We already hit headwinds, and we've already heard of some of the headwinds in some of the talks. Um, it, fundamentally, the problems come down 
to people's world views. World views are what really cause political problems. They're belief systems. In other words, you know, I, I've always voted on the left. My brother has always voted on the right. So it's clearly not genetic. David's worldviews, he's a farmer, are quite, quite different to mine. Worldviews are where, where, where problems are, because they're not really easily amenable to, art, to facts. So, for example, uh, in flood control, you've got a real di dilemma, but it seems to have resolved, more be resolved now, between natural flood management, as I've just been talking about, and the, 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 and, you know, and the dredges and canalizers and the concrete pourers. The best way to control floods is dredge, it's canalise and, 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 and pour concrete. And that's an engineering view. And, and you know, people can genuinely hold those views and they think I'm mad. Um, I hold different views and think they're mad. And that's where the dilemmas come. So just simplifying some other ones, the upland, upland landscapes more generally, uh, uh, most of our upland landscapes in Wales, in the Pennines, in, in, in the huge areas of Scotland, are just biological deserts. Uh, largely due to sheep grazing, um, mural and maggots, as Adam Watson used to call them. And, and you know, any, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't do that, given the, all the prob you know, problems of flooding, the, the water running off, the, 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 the fact that that, it, those in, that sheep industry is only viable with massive, and it really is subsidy, it's not, it's not, it's not paying people to do something that society wants. That worldview, which I think uh, you know, we would, I'd like to see much more intelligent things done with the uplands, spies smack in the face of the people who believe in cultural landscapes. The importance of sheep farming, the importance of the way that we manage our uplands. The whole of the Lake District is one bloody great big sheep farm. And it, the, the National Trust got into terrible problems with Melvin Bragg and other people last year when it tried to uh, gently remove sheep farming from Borrowdale because they were accused of, 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 of almost sacrilege for destroying cultural landscapes and a way of life. There isn't any easy answer to that one, except we keep pegging away and keep putting the arguments and keep thinking about what we do. But actually, without European Union subsidies, sheep farming is probably not viable over most of the uplands. So there may be fantastic opportunities there, but it has profound cultural implications. Um, the, uh, the politically, uh, there are, again, fundamental worldviews. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, green, the, the, the green taxes, the payment for ecosystem services that we talked about briefly this morning, perverse subsidies and so on, um, that I think well, there, there are things that, are, the things that we should uh, be, be paying people for. There are things that we should, that society does need, uh, the, the whole green economics area, and I think we can put a value on wildlife uh, versus the, the, you know, the blindly, completely different view of something like, let's say, the powerful vested interests of the grouse shooting lobby. I mean, grouse shooters are environmental vandals. Complete environmental vandals. And yet they present themselves as custodians of the countryside. Yeah, don't get me going. Um, and then that really small, you know, another worldview that, that, that we're such a small, overcrowded country, we can't make more space for nature. Um, we are a crowded country. We're not quite as crowded as the Netherlands, but we are a crowded country. Uh, and we're going to get more crowded. I mean, you know, one of the things that hasn't been mentioned today in, in the future's thinking, the UK will be more populous than France by 2030 and will be more populous than Germany by 2040 on a, a less than half the land area. So, so there are real challenges in terms of just people and infrastructure. People have to have homes. You know, we have to have infrastructure and so on. Um, and it, 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 but I don't think that means that we can't make space for nature. Of course we can make space for nature for the benefit of people as well as wildlife. And we just have to keep pegging away at that and let people see that you can make space for nature and it isn't sterilise the land and it isn't an impediment to economic progress. With a bit of intelligence and effort, we can make it work. The other thing we need to bear in mind is that more, bigger, better and joined applied to, to protected areas on their own will not be enough. It isn't just, as, as David said this morning, it isn't even often a question of biology or a question of ecology. It's a question of hearts and minds and politics of people. Um, our, our ability to bring back the wild is going to be uh, influenced not by, but not by just eco ecological work, which we need, but how tight and permeable the boundaries of the protected areas are, um, 
uh, it, the nature of the landscape outside the protected area and the attitude of human beings inside and round the protected area. And it's the attitude of the human beings that's really, really important. Um, but, you know, wolves in parts of Europe exist already even when people are at a density 3,000 people per square kilometre can coexist with wolves. The white-tailed eagle population, I, did, I wish I'd taken that picture, that's not one of mine, that was taken by a friend on Mull um, last summer, he gave it to me and said, eat your heart out. White -tailed, most of the white-tailed eagles in Scotland are not in protected areas at all. Some of the nests are protected, but most of them are in, in, in working landscapes. Um, and... Uh, Lynx, I think it would, we've already alluded to lynx, I think we could put lynx back big time, but again, there'll be all kinds of, uh, uh, the, the Kildare, the Lake District, Abernethy, and so on. But there are people strongly opposed to it, and that's a hearts and minds job of persuasion, a worldview, and we'll have to persuade people. It isn't really anything to do with science anymore, it's about hearts and minds and people. So that the future of landscape scale conservation, if we, if, we are to be, if we are to be truly ambitious, doesn't less lie, or even uh, you know, at all, with more, bigger, better, enjoying nature, science and ecology and so on. But it's going to involve winning hearts and minds. Getting the politics right uh, to make space for nature in a crowded world, inside and outside strictly protected areas. Um, that is, as again, be alluded to reconnecting people with nature. So we've been mainly talking about biology and ecology and science and, and the management and so on. But some of you have talked about the need to persuade people and win the political arguments. That's what we're going to have to do. It's a, it'll be a long, hard slog and we will, it will need repeating and repeating and repeating. But if we keep pegging away, if we are determined to deliver more space for nature. I think we're right on the edge of something absolutely brilliant, and I think we can do it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, thank you, John. That was a fantastic overview and some real interesting insights uh, into all the different approaches. Um, I just want to pick up, not surprisingly, on the National Trust one, because I'm Simon Pryor from the, from the National Trust. Um, firstly, thanks to you and Tom Chu for the better, bigger, more enjoyed. We did build our whole strategy uh, around that phrase. Um, and I think it's probably useful just to acknowledge the influence of, of NEP and Charlie, because we actually developed many of the key principles of that strategy, sat in this very room uh, and wandering around NEP, and actually um, with, a, with a backdrop sound of, the, of that um, male wren hammering away on his uh, alarm call the, the whole way through um, our discussions. Um, but um, the thing I wanted to pick up on was the mild, um, uh, very mild uh, rewilding, I think, me mention you made. Um, because um, we're actually much more enthusiastic about that. Um, and, uh, um, we are so enth mention... enthusiastic about mild rewilding or being more enthusiastic about rewilding and making it not mild? <laughs> yeah, well, I think... I think um, uh, we, we've been, been enthusiastic in the big, beginning with Wiccan and, and Ennerdale, uh, as you say. Um, I was really wanting your help, to be honest, on, on an advice from the audience on how we use that word, because it's fantastically inspirational, and Jonathan and others have talked about the emotional reach it has, the dynamism, the energy. This feels like a fresh new start. But on the other hand, I have other people clamoring my other ear, saying, you know, this is incredibly divisive, it's antagonistic, you know, you're, you're creating a real problem. Uh, is it a word we should drop? Uh, is it a word we should, we should use with caution? Or, or should we run with it and actually say, look, and, and bring people with us in terms of saying this is really great? I mean, you know, I don't play any particular expertise in this, but, you know, you can't... The French have tried it, we've tried it from time to time in Britain with the language police. You try and get people to change the way they use a word, or what it means. The languages evolve. Rewilding's in the vocabulary, it's convenient, it's shorthand. I don't think we'll be able to stop people using it. I don't think we should. But I think we should try and explain when we talk, what I do now with people, and I'd say, when I talk about rewilding, I say, this is not, most of the time, this has got nothing to do with bears and wolves and wilderness. 
It's a process that moves nature conservation from small local reserves to making them more and more and more natural. The rewilding is a process of bringing it, 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 more, bigger, better enjoyed and creating more habitats. In some places, it will be possible uh, to really, really go the whole, the whole hog and do you know, major, massive rewilding. But that won't be the majority of examples, in my, my view. And I just try and explain to people, because I don't think you can put rewilding back in the box. Uh, hello, I'm Christopher Hewitt from Natural England, and I've been very involved with something that, that as you called them, the farming clusters um, over the last, so let's say last year, and there is a huge appetite amongst farmers, but if not hundreds of farmers, if not thousands of farmers, to actually show what these 30 years of agri-environment and uh, 50 years of SSI protection, because a lot of them are farming SSSIs. But one of the challenges, particularly one, one group found um, that was one of the earliest ones, which was not far from Mul Marlborough Downs, but the Martin Downs farming cluster, is to, to, to get support on how to monitor at a, land a landscape scale and show the joined up nature of their working together. And that's been their biggest challenge, sort of trying to work out how do we use those mechanisms that are in place. So any suggestions? The, the, the whole question of monitoring is, is, is actually much more complicated than one I might initially think. Um, you know, the scientist in me says, yes, of course, you know, when you do something like this, uh, and indeed funders uh, but, but, but also need reassuring, that their money has been well spent and it has achieved what you want to achieve. But... You, and you can do two things. You can, you know, some, for some people, monitoring uh, is, is, is outputs. So I dug this many ponds, I planted this many miles of hedge, I recreated this many acres of uh, herbage grasslands. That actually isn't monitoring. That, that's, a, that's an outcome. What you want is the output. What happened? And that's actually much more difficult. And the nature improvement area schemes, you know, which are still, there's 12 areas are still going, they're, they're still being developed. All, that, that whole nature improvement program almost founded completely on the fact that DEFRA, because it was public money, or some of it was money, quite rightly wanted the, you know, the, the outputs, monitoring. And the, 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 most of the people who wanted to just, you know, do some nature conservation didn't have the skills or the knowledge or the equipment or the techniques to measure phosphates in water or nitrates in water or, or count bats and, you know, or look at the biodiversity of insects in grass. So they just didn't have the, the engine power, the funds or the skills to do it. And so in the end, we, we, we greatly simplified the amount of monitoring that went on, but there was some. And I, I think what we're going to have to do, you know, if this gets really, as it is taking off, I think we may have to resort to proxy technologies that you can do from satellites, you can do from space, you can do from drones, uh, you, or, or simple things that you can measure in water that are a proxy for whether it's clean or dirty, you know, and so on. But I think the idea of doing what I would regard as detailed scientific monitoring is probably, got, if we're not careful, it'll kill the projects. Because whatever people are doing, it's got to be better than the stuff that was there before. And you might, you know, and then you might want to do a really simple, one of the, I kept saying at the NIS for the ones that it applied to, go and count skylarks. You'll know when you've come to the boundary of the NIA because you're able to hear the skylarks singing. Simple things like that, but I mean, that, that's a bit, that was a bit flippant, but I mean, I, I think we have to think hard about how we get effective, easy to use proxies, and I think a lot of modern technology will actually probably allow us to do that. Uh, absolutely. I mean, one of the one of the successes is uh, in, is, is simply one of the successes was uh, on the Durham Valley NIA. They just counted water voles. Everybody loves water voles. <laughs> Ratty. Uh, and, and it was great. You could say, look, we put a bit all these wetlands in and we, we started off with five water voles and now we've got 500. You, know, <laughs> you must have done something, right? I don't know. How much monitoring goes on in, in New Spanders, Pastor? But those are, those are, so they monitor the bird species, yes. but, but what about, you know, what about invertebrates or fungi or water beetles? Very few, or, very few. That has been a complaint, but uh, you could say the Oostwaters Plus is a bird directive uh, okay. area. So that, but on the other hand, you're right. Uh, there's more asking for butterflies, for 
other things because sometimes you have also that one species goes down but then suddenly other, yeah, yeah. other species but, you know, appear. But it is a dilemma because then it takes a huge amount of effort and time and money yes, and yes, so on. Yes, it's a real and, dilemma. And mo I think the most important thing is money yeah. because you have to do it by classified people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Is that on? Yes, uh, my name is Paul Goria. I just wanted to ask um, whether you think that our legislative framework going forward is going to be fit for purpose for any of these initiatives. Um, if not, what sort of reforms would be needed and how we can get them done given that we're going to have an agriculture bill before any future environment um, amendments. And um, if there is going to be future legislation that maybe ecologists should participate in actually drawing up in future rather than just having it imposed by civil servants, um, there might be scope for actually trying to relate people to nature because there's still too much of the nature conservation legislation, in my opinion, divorcing people from the benefits that they derive from the very ecosystem services functions that we're trying to establish for the benefit of them. We're regarded as a separate sector, not environmental engineers delivering goods for people. I mean, I, I'm not an environmental lawyer, but I've thought quite a lot about some aspects of that, but not so much about others. One of the, I mean, the, again, we've heard it from several, in several, at least two of the, the talks we've heard in the last day or day and a half, where the, um, the legislation, the legal requirements uh, for the, to, to continue to maintain a, a protected site and so on and so forth, I think unbelievably static. Uh, you know, they, they take a fixed view. Uh, France actually talked about this. You, you know, you, you, you've got to have this many, this many of this and this many of that, and, and, and the presence of these species means that the site is healthy and so on. Um, that's going to be that's completely useless in a, in a changing world, and it's completely useless if you're trying to restore dynamic processes. Uh, on a big scale, because that's because species will come and go, and I just and think about climate change, as we as species begin to re, are already redistributing themselves around around the face of the planet. Some sites are already losing species. So if you take the the, the, the Bristol Channel, for example, one of its designations as an SSSI is because it's the number of wintering Dunlin, wintering Redshank, wintering other waders. Well, because it's much milder on the continent than it was when that. That, 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 that designation came in, the Dunlin don't come anymore. So the Dunlin are already below the level that you, it's supposed to have because they're staying in Holland. <laughs> but, those, but you reverse that. How on earth do we create nature reserves for species that aren't there yet? Because that's what's going to That's what's happening. Um, so you've got SS... And one of the interesting things is when species do come into the UK, and we know this particularly elegantly for, for birds... Uh, 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 but also, uh, also for dragonflies now, uh, that the, the places those species, those colonising species turn up are sites of special scientific interest, SSSIs. Uh, th that's the first place they go. I mean, they don't all go there, but and then they spread out into the wider countryside from there. So one of the, so, so the, you know, they're the, the dynamic places that are already changing faster than the lawyers can keep up with them. And I don't know what the solution is, but I do know we need a legal framework that allows nature to change and be dynamic. Uh, and you know, increasingly we're going to need that. But how we do that, uh, I think I need to talk to my learned friends. The amount of money the UK government put into the nature improvement areas, it was seed corn. Uh, it, was, it was a very relatively small amount of money, uh, three quarters of a million quid that George Osborne found down the back of his sofa. Um, but they've in, in that, that levered many millions of pounds in, in working in kind, uh, and uh, they, they've all found various ways of generating income to maintain. Because you know, if local people want to have a nature improvement area because it makes their life more interesting, they find ways of raising the money to, to keep it going. My, my own view is that government ought to have more responsibility. Uh, but that isn't a fashionable thing to say at the moment. I mean, the sign of a civilised society is to have fine art galleries, you know, other facilities provided by government, clean parks, places for kids to play, uh, and nature reserve. You know, and I, I've, I've no doubt about that, but we won't get that with the, the present lot, so let's just find other ways of raising money. There is growing interest amongst major 
industry players, major wealthy private donors, not just to put money into the ballet or concerts or art, but to put money into nature conservation, which is what's happening with the Cambridge, you know, with the Arcadia things. So I think we can make it work. We've just got to change our mindset and get out and find the people with the money and get them to give it to us. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Rebecca Wrigley from Rewilding Britain, and I just wanted to pick up on what you were saying about worldview and how important that is, and also what Simon was saying about the world, word rewilding and thoughts on that. And one of the things that we've been working on um, in trying to set up or catalyze pilot projects to make happen exactly what we've been discussing in the last couple of days is the importance of narrative. And for us, it's it's not, we haven't experienced so much problem with the word rewilding. Um, you know, there are, um, there are issues with it, but it's almost like what comes behind, what's the narrative that we use and how do we spend time working in the areas where we, might, where we want to pilot rewilding, understanding what the shared values and shared purpose are between the local people who have knowledge and understanding of the land and its nature, between all the different people that might need to come together to make that happen. And one of the things that has really come out for me over the last few days and building on, on Franz's work is, is, the important, is the understanding that people are part of nature and nature is part of people. And, and um, that, so, so therefore it's about balance and about finding a balance that works for people and works for nature and works economically and ecologically. So, um, so my eyes have been open to that, but it's also a thread that we're using um, yeah, yeah, in terms yeah. of building that na narrative and spending the time to talk to as many people as possible and find that shared purpose and shared values and not so much about just the word rewilding. It's about the meaning behind it. I, I, I completely agree with that. Narrative is actually really important. And I, I... Politicians and people in general, for perfectly understandable reasons, like good news stories. They do not like to be told the sky is falling down. Now, we, we know it is falling down in places, and we know that we're hemorrhaging species and so on and so forth. But saying we're losing species, you know, water's getting more polluted, better, etc., is not even going to get close to winning the battle, never mind the war. What will make a difference is the, nar is the narrative. And if we say, look, we know how to do this stuff. It's good for people. It's good for people because... I mean, we know access to high-quality green space and interesting nature is incredibly good for people's physical and mental well-being. The, over, the evidence on that is now overwhelming. So, you know, we can point that out as a perfectly good reason why society should invest in high-quality green space and nature conservation. Um, you, you know, we saw those marvellous pictures this morning of people bicycling among bison. God, I'd love to do that. It's exciting, it's interesting, it's good news, and we know how to do it. So rather than, you know, if, so if, we can, if we can keep telling people, whenever I get a chance with a minister or, or, or a, a senior civil servant, I point out that this is all good news, and, and, and people like it. It is said, and, and the Brits and the Dutch are unusual in this regard, in the total uh, the absolute obsession with birds and nature conservation and so on and so forth. It is said, and I, I still haven't been able to nail it down, but it was told me by somebody, by a senior person in RSBB, there are more Brits, adult Brits, put a pair of binoculars around their neck and go out into the countryside at the weekend uh, just to walk and to watch birds and to look at flowers and butterflies than go to Premier League football matches. It's just that you don't see them all in one place. Thank God. <laughs> now, that, that's, a re, you know, that's a really telling statistic. Let's, let's argue that. Let's say to people, want this. They want quality of life. They, don't, they, they want jobs. They, they, of course they do. They want security for their kids and so on. But also they want... They, we love nature as a nation. People like to be outside. Uh, and I think uh, we need to give the good stories, good news stories to politicians to say, we can do this for you. It, it helps you win elections. And if we do it positively, I think we've got much more chance of winning the war. Yeah. Hello, uh, John. You know me. My name is uh, Michael McCarthy. Uh, I've uh, been fascinated by everything I've heard over the last two days. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the reintroduction of a post process 
of the process-led uh, way of managing the natural world uh, is entirely right. But there's something that I've heard no mention of uh, whatsoever in, in the last day and a half, which seems to me to be the single biggest problem facing us at the moment, which is largely ignored, which is the catastrophic crash in invertebrate numbers, uh, which is happening uh, certainly uh, probably in America, certainly in England, uh, in the United Kingdom, I mean, partly because it's not monitored. We have 26,000 insect species and 99.999% of them are not monitored in terms of their biomass. But not only is their biomass disappearing, the species diversity is also tumbling. You probably saw six weeks ago there was a paper in Science about the two nature reserves in Germany where insect numbers, which was the first time this has ever been measured, had collapsed by 80% over 20 years. And um, if the bottom of the food chain uh, for most animals is being completely wiped out, and we're sort of standing there and not even noticing that it's happening, it seems to me that uh, all the ideas of bringing more wildlife back to the wider countryside, in the end, are going to run into the ground. Well, there's a bit of doom and gloom, and Matt's right. I'm, you know, there's been a catastrophic collapse uh, in, 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 uh, small, in, in small invertebrates, insects. But, you know, it... it you don't actually, this is anecdotal, but it's also a lot of other people have commented. When I was a child, my father got our first car, and we would drive at night. The windscreen, when we got there, was flattered with moths, with the, you know, insects we've killed. It doesn't happen anymore. You, you, you know, you, and, and butterfly populations are almost in free fall, wherever you look. We, we, do know, we do know that. Mike, if I had to... Uh, I was talking to Ian Newton about this uh, 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 yesterday, I think it was Ian. Um, the, you know, if I had to put my money, and I would be prepared to put money, on what's causing that, I would say it's neonicotinoids, which are just ubiquitous in the environment. They're in the water. I mean, neonicotinoids are really, really stupid things. It's like, you know, w w who would you put? pesticides in all your plants so that anything that occurs there, that then, then, then get into the pollen, get into the seeds, get into the leaves, and, and, then, and get it, then get into the water, they're water soluble, they get into the soil. It's, all, it's turned out to be the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, when they were beginning to research the impact of neonicotinoids on bees, and there are three main kinds of neonicotinoids, they're not necessarily all tarred with the same brush, uh, but uh, they found it almost impossible in lowland England to find a control landscape that didn't have any nicotine noise in it. You couldn't find a control site to do the experiment. But, but, but just briefly, as a follow-up, uh, it seems to me that this is not, as it were, a tactical problem, it's a strategic it's problem. A fundamental strategic problem. Isn't what it? is a strategic answer? Well, the, the evidence is slowly accumulating, uh, the, the, in fact, it's fairly rapidly accumulating, that there is a serious problem. The industry, Bayer and others, are now doing exactly what they did with DDT and beginning to fight back and say there's no evidence, blah de blah de blah uh, And I just think the scientific case has to be plugged really, really hard, because we're in a, more or less exactly the same trajectory as we were with, with DDT, Aldrin and Dildrin, where the industry refused to accept there was a problem, and did a lot of dodgy science uh, to make sure he did, you know, nobody stopped them using those dreadful compounds. And they were, they, they were even worse because they accumulated up food chains. I don't think there's any evidence that neonicotinoids accumulate, but they're certainly water-soluble and they're certainly present in all water courses and they're pretty well ubiquitous in soil. Uh, I think they're horrible news. And you can quote me on that. <laughs> um, well, you will, won't you? <laughs> Let's thank Bill and John very much. <laughs> <laughs>